SpaceX may have lost Booster 18 in a violent explosion, and the setback has reshaped the near-term timeline, but the pace hasn't slowed for a moment. Block 3 hardware is advancing rapidly, and Pad 2 is being pushed hard toward operational readiness, even though recent activity hints at ongoing rework, retesting, and unexpected hardware removal. Let's delve into the details. SpaceX is targeting Flight 12 in the first quarter of next year, and its quick pivot after the Booster 18 loss highlights how mature the Starship program has become. Rather than pausing, the company immediately shifted to Booster 19 as the new mission vehicle. Over the past week, six Booster 19 oxygen tank rings were moved into Mega Bay 1, where stacking is now underway. The final ring, transferred early Thursday morning, completes the LOX tank barrel section, except for the aft dome. The aft dome will be installed once the methane transfer tube is fitted inside the oxygen tank. The lower section of the landing oxygen tank, which feeds oxidizer for the final tower landing burn, was also moved into Mega Bay on Thursday. Methane tank rings currently staged inside the Star Factory are expected to be transferred in the coming days to continue the stacking sequence. Once fully stacked, Booster 19 will enter the standard qualification flow, beginning with cryogenic proof testing to validate tank integrity, weld quality, and structural margins under liquid nitrogen loads. If the booster performs as expected, teams will proceed to engine installation and static fire operations. Parallel work continues on the upper stage. Ship 39. The first Block 3 ship is fully stacked in Mega Bay 2 and preparing for its cryogenic proof campaign. Engine installation will begin after successful cryo testing. Afterward, the ship will be transported to Massey's for a full duration static fire. Reconstruction at Massey's following the Ship 36 incident has entered its final phase. The ship test stand, propellant systems, and surrounding ground infrastructure have been largely rebuilt, and methane farm upgrades are nearing completion. With structural work nearly finished and system tie-ins progressing, the site remains on schedule to support Ship 39's static fire campaign early next year. Booster 19's static fire campaign will take place at Pad 2, marking the first full test of the pad infrastructures as well. Pad 2 has reached its final outfitting and checkout phase, but recent hardware removals indicate that several systems required rework. Two weeks ago, the Liquid Oxygen Booster Quick Disconnect Hood installed only days earlier, was taken off, and teams ran 17 extension and retraction cycles of the QD mechanism. This almost certainly indicates that once the hood was installed, the system exhibited mechanical resistance or alignment issues that prevented smooth actuation. The hood was later reinstalled, signaling that the problems were corrected. On December 1st, the methane side BQD hood was removed for the same series of tests strongly suggesting a shared mechanical issue related to actuator stroke tolerances, clearance margins, or interference between the umbilical plumbing and hood structure. Once engineers have corrected the problems and are satisfied with the mechanism's reliability, the methane side hood will be reinstalled and final validation will begin. This includes full range actuation with the hoods installed, nitrogen purge leak checks, valve timing verification, subsystem integrity testing, and confirmation of sensor loops, electrical circuits, and pressure relief paths. Pad 2's launch tower is also experiencing its share of rework. Recently, hydraulic actuators responsible for controlling the tower arms were removed, and a week earlier, the accumulators, which store high-pressure hydraulic fluid that drives actuator motion, were also taken off the system. This typically indicates that earlier arm tests revealed insufficient force output, response time issues, or damping inconsistencies, or that SpaceX is upgrading the hydraulic package to units with higher flow capacity, improved stability, and tighter servo control tolerances. Together, the BQD rework and the actuator replacements show that Pad 2 systems once considered complete are now receiving final adjustments before activation. These fixes reflect a normal debugging phase, not a major redesign. The ship quick disconnect arm on the tower is receiving additional plumbing. Teams are installing plumbing segments that link the tower side propellant and vent lines to the arm side interfaces, completing the full fueling path for the upper stage. In parallel, the arm has been put into slow actuation cycles to verify structural alignment, joint tolerances, actuator and hydraulic behavior before full speed operation. At the same time, the arm's extension section at the Sanchez site is receiving internal plumbing, wiring, and control units. This piece will be lifted and attached to the main arm in the coming days. Later, teams will install the ship's main quick disconnect interface, along with the propellant plumbing, power and data umbilicals, and control systems. 
The completed arm will then undergo full extension and retraction testing and nitrogen purge operations to validate propellant line sealing, valve performance, sensor behavior, and venting systems for upper stage loading. With installations ending and final checks underway, Pad 2 remains on schedule to be fully operational by January and ready to support Booster 19's static fire. A short distance away, Pad 1 demolition continues. With the launch mount fully removed, crews are dismantling the water deluge infrastructure beneath the pad, including the steel discharge plate and buried conduits connecting the deluge array to the tanks. Surface pipes, particularly the weir lines feeding the discharge plate, are being cut and removed. Next, crews will extract the buried conduits and the discharge plate itself. Once these layers are cleared, excavation will begin on the deep foundation system, reinforced concrete piles driven up to 35 meters into the ground. Each pile must be exposed, fractured, and removed with heavy hydraulic breakers and cutting tools. Clearing the piles allows reshaping of the site for the new flame trench, one of the most labor-intensive steps of the rebuild. At the Massey's test site, scrapping of Booster 18 is nearly complete, with only the lower LOX tank section remaining. The aft may be scrapped on site or could be moved to production site for detailed inspections in the coming days. Once the booster remnants are gone, teams will repair the cryogenic test stand damaged in the explosion. A hydraulic accumulator used to store pressurized fluid for the actuator system that simulates engine thrust loads during cryogenic tests was destroyed, releasing oil across the stand. That unit, and possibly others, must be replaced. After debris removal, engineers will inspect the structure for distorted frames, cracked welds, damaged fittings, and failed sensors. The stand must be fully restored before Booster 19 arrives for cryoproofing, and based on SpaceX's typical turnaround rate, the facility is likely to be ready just in time. SpaceX has released a 6-minute, 40-second Raptor V3 test video described as validation testing on a Raptor 3 performing a Starship V3 ascent burn. The campaign replicates the conditions the three center engines experience from ignition during stage separation through ascent and main engine cutoff once the upper stage reaches orbit. Multiple test runs simulate the full range of in-flight environment Starship encounters on its climb to orbit, including throttle changes, rapid transients, engine gimbling under load, mixture ratio shifts, chamber pressure variations, thermal and structural stress buildup, and acceleration-driven vibration modes transmitted through the aft section. The engine ran flawlessly for the entire 400-second burn, demonstrating stable operation across every regime tested. Together, these runs validate Raptor V3's performance across the full ascent profile and provide engineers with the high-fidelity data needed to refine throttle control, gimbal response, mixture management, combustion stability, control algorithms, and structural margins, directly improving engine reliability and Starship's overall ascent performance. Now, Let's discuss the latest updates from the world of science and technology. Russian cosmonaut Oleg Artemyev has been removed from SpaceX's Crew-12 mission to the International Space Station after allegedly photographing sensitive, proprietary materials inside a SpaceX facility. Artemyev, a veteran with more than 560 days in space across three long-duration missions, had been assigned to launch no earlier than February 15 next year aboard a SpaceX Falcon 9 and Crew Dragon. Of the four planned Crew-12 members, only two had been publicly identified, Artemia for Roscosmos and Sophie Adenot for ESA, while NASA had not yet announced its astronauts. Artemyev was removed just months before launch, after allegations that he used his phone to photograph SpaceX engines and internal technical documents during training at the company's Hawthorne, California facility, then left with the data still stored on his device. SpaceX's Hawthorne headquarters houses engineering documentation for Falcon 9, Merlin engines, Crew Dragon systems, and much of the design data for Starship and Raptor, even though Starship hardware is built and tested primarily at Starbase. This means the photographed material could have included sensitive technical data from any of these programs. Such conduct constitutes a direct violation of ITAR, the U.S. regulations governing the handling and export of sensitive aerospace and defense-related technical data. Surveillance systems reportedly detected the breach quickly. After this, Artemyev was suspended from training, removed from the mission, and expelled from the United States. Roscosmos later announced his reassignment on December 2nd, describing it vaguely as a transition to other work. He has been replaced on Crew-12 by cosmonaut Andrei Fedyev. Both NASA and SpaceX have declined public comment to avoid escalating diplomatic tensions.
While it is not yet clear whether Artemyev acted deliberately, export control experts note that accidental violations of this scale are rare, especially from a senior cosmonaut familiar with strict handling protocols. The seriousness of the incident lies in the potential value of the images. Even a few unauthorized photos could expose proprietary engineering details, engine geometries, internal plumbing, material choices, or control system layouts that contribute to SpaceX's performance advantages. Such data could accelerate foreign missile or launch vehicle development, reveal insights into U.S. propulsion capabilities, or help adversaries design countermeasures in an increasingly contested orbital environment. Under ITAR, even the risk of controlled data reaching foreign defense organizations is treated as a significant national security threat. NASA, SpaceX, and multiple U.S. government agencies have launched an interagency investigation. However, no criminal charges have been filed yet. Any prosecution would depend on evidence of intent, as criminal ITAR cases require proof of a willful attempt to transfer controlled data. Unintentional breaches are usually addressed through administrative or diplomatic actions rather than criminal trials. Artemyev's removal highlights the strict enforcement of export control laws in joint missions involving international crew. The case is being viewed as a major security breach, and its outcome may influence future cooperation between the United States and Roscosmos, as human spaceflight becomes increasingly tied to national strategic considerations. China's private launch company Landspace has flown its methane-powered stainless steel Zhu K3 to space on its debut mission. But the first stage landing attempt fell short. The failure was dramatic, and the cause is worth a closer look. Landspace, founded in 2015, initially developed the solid-fueled Zhu K-1 rocket, which failed to reach orbit on its sole flight in 2018. The company then shifted its focus to the liquid methane and liquid oxygen-powered Zhu K-2, which has successfully reached orbit four times in its six attempts so far, and was also the first methane-fueled rocket to reach orbit. With these foundational successes and failures behind them, Landspace advanced toward the Zhu K-3 rocket, which represents a significant leap in their capabilities. Zhu K-3 is designed as a two-stage reusable launch vehicle made entirely of stainless steel and uses liquid methane and liquid oxygen as propellants. Standing at 65 meters tall with a 4.5 meter diameter, it has an estimated liftoff weight of about 550 tons. The first stage is powered by nine TQ-12A engines, generating a combined thrust of 7,200 kilonewtons, enabling it to carry payloads of up to 11.8 metric tons into low Earth orbit when fully expendable. The second stage is equipped with a TQ-15A engine, delivering a vacuum thrust of 944 kilonewtons. Notably, Zhu K-3's first stage is designed for reusability, featuring four grid fins and deployable landing legs, allowing it to be reused for up to 20 launches. The company has conducted several hop tests of the first stage in previous years, with the test vehicles flying to altitudes as low as 350 meters and up to 10 kilometers before returning to the surface and landing accurately on the designated landing zone. These tests collectively verified key return to launch site and landing technologies and laid the foundation for the recent full-scale Zhu K-3 launch. The launch took place on December 3rd from the Jiuquan Satellite Launch Center in northern China. Liftoff was smooth, and Zhu K-3 climbed away from the pad with a nominal ascent profile. Stage separation events occurred two minutes later, and the upper stage ignited cleanly, guiding the vehicle into a 450-kilometer circular orbit inclined at 41.5 degrees. For this debut mission, the rocket carried a 1,000-kilogram structural mass simulator representing the future How Long cargo spacecraft that Landspace plans to use for Tiangong Space Station resupply missions. How Long is designed as a reusable, winged spaceplane with a runway landing capability, conceptually similar to NASA's space shuttle, but far smaller, around 10 meters long, and weighing roughly 7,000 kilograms. Future Zhu K-3 missions will launch operational How Long spacecraft, making this dummy payload a realistic dress rehearsal for Tiangong logistics flights. Although the upper stage performed with mechanical precision, the first stage's return did not go as planned. After separation, the booster executed a boost-back burn using its center engine, deployed its grid fins, and followed a guided descent trajectory similar to Falcon 9's return-to-launch site profile, including a 46-second three-engine re-entry burn when it hit the denser part of the atmosphere. The recovery plan relied on reigniting three engines at around 500 meters altitude for a roughly 30-second landing burn 
followed by deployment of the landing legs and a soft touchdown at less than one meter per second. However, during the landing burn, an abnormal combustion event occurred. One of the engines suffered a failure significant enough to ignite the booster mid-descent. With thrust lost and the vehicle compromised, the stage impacted near the landing pad and underwent a rapid unscheduled disassembly, scattering burning debris around the landing zone. Despite the failed landing, Juke 3s smooth liftoff, clean staging, and precise orbital insertion mark a major milestone for Landspace on its very first attempt. The data from the recovery attempt anomaly will drive improvements in engine reliability and recovery systems as the company pushes toward joining SpaceX and Blue Origin in the small group capable of landing an orbital class booster. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.